welcome to the panel, All Roads Lead to Home, Limiting Barriers uh, to Housing for People with Justice System Involvement. My name is Allison Wilkie. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Prisoner Reentry Institute at John Jay College, and I'm very happy to be here with my distinguished colleagues. Um, first, I'm going to do a sound check. Can everyone hear okay? Especially, no. That's why I asked. Let me try and speak into this a little bit closer. I'm going to eat it. Um, I will rely on you folks in the back to be my sound check and all of our sound checks. So if you're having problems hearing, go like this and I can help us all speak louder. Um, I also wanted to get a sense of who is in the room. Um, and I'm going to try and throw out some categories and some of you guys are going to fall into multiple categories, but just raise your hands. Um, how many of you guys are housing providers? Okay, so that's a lot of the room. Uh, developers? Okay. <laughs> Uh, like human service providers, great. And any other category that you want to throw out that doesn't isn't captured by those? Local government. Government, thank you. We've got some government. How about people with justice involvement? Perfect. Let's thank you. Them. Yes, <laughs> I appreciate that. People with justice involvement. Although some people may not want to identify. So. <laughs> and and I think there are a lawyer or two practice in this area in the room. I recognize a particular one. Well, it can't be an important room without lawyers in it. So, <laughs> um, so just to frame this issue a little bit, the, the size and the punitiveness of the criminal justice system in the United States is really unmatched in the rest of the world. Um, more people than ever have to contend with the fallout of having a criminal record. One in three American youth report being arrested by the age of 23. And as of 2010, there were 20 million Americans with felony convictions. That's 8% of the entire population. The incarceration rate in the United States is the highest in the world. It's 698 out of 100,000 residents. And while the United States is about 4.4% of the world's population, it houses around 22% of the world's prison population. And so how does this play out in New York State? Let me give you a few numbers, a few estimates, because it is actually a difficult thing to determine how many people have criminal records. That, that data is not easily kept. Um, but some researchers have tried to estimate that. And in a 2016 report, they found that the number of adults in New York State with either an arrest or a conviction record was 6,958,700, so it's probably over 7 million at this point, and that's 45% of the adult population in New York State with either an arrest or a conviction record. Breaking that down a little further, um, as of 2000, a 2010 estimate, over 627,000 adults in New York State have felony convictions, so that's just under 5% of the total population. Uh, 295,000 adults in New York State have been incarcerated in prison. And in 2017, there were uh, over 21,000 people released from prison in New York State. And that number is actually a, a little lower than in previous years, but that's a fairly consistent number um, with the low 20,000s of people who are released um, from prison each year in, in just in New York State. So these numbers mean that there is a huge population of people with conviction histories and who are dealing with the barriers of that conviction history. Background checks and criminal records are used at every, term, every turn and people face them when they're seeking basic human needs like housing, like employment. Um, so I do want to highlight that, that this isn't just a criminal justice issue or criminal records issue. Um, whether a person ends up in the justice system is, of course, also determined a lot by race and economic disadvantage. So we know that incarcerated people in all gender, race, and ethnicity groups are substantially less prior to their incarceration than people who have not been incarcerated. Um, and we know that people who have been incarcerated earn far less after their incarceration. And we also know that law enforcement is targeted towards um, neighborhoods with primarily black and Latinx people and people who are economically disadvantaged. Um, you know, even here in New York City where the NYPD has drastically limited uh, the, its enforcement of marijuana and, and drastically limited arrests of marijuana of those people who are still being arrested 
92% are black or Latinx. So the racial disparities are huge, and I just want to call that out because I don't think we can have a conversation about criminal justice without talking about race and without talking about economic disadvantage. Um, and people with mental health disorders are more likely to be arrested and, and incarcerated. Um, and after incarceration, because of the conditions of incarceration, people struggle with both mental health and with physical health. So the people that we're talking about who need housing are multiply marginalized, and understanding the intersection of all these issues is important for addressing the issue. And that does bring us to the importance of housing. Housing is a platform for opportunity. Housing is necessary for people to live full lives, to be able to seek and maintain employment. Housing necess is necessary to being able to support and care for your families. Um, Stable housing also increases public safety and it increases the likelihood that people will have the social supports necessary to keep them from going back to the criminal justice system. It also makes it easier for people who are under supervision by parole and probation uh, systems to comply with the terms of that su supervision and it makes it easier for those systems to actually supervise people if they have stable housing. Um, providing a home for people helps them and helps their families. And so housing is such a critical element to addressing uh, criminal justice issues and the problems in that system. So for this panel, we are going to be talking about a really unique collaboration in Syracuse um, to build and provide housing for people with justice system involvement. And I'm not gonna read the bio of, of my panelists, um, other than to say that we have Joanne Page, who's the president and CEO of the Fortune Society, and David Condliffe, who's the executive director of the Center for Community Alternatives. Uh, I won't read bios, I will just say that these two are pillars in the criminal justice community, and because of the housing need, are, are now pillars in the housing community, and I'm excited to have their expertise with us here today. Um, so I'm gonna first turn it over to Joanne um, to talk to us a little bit about the issue here, the problem, what are the issues we're trying to address, and to really set the table of what the housing need is here. So I'm gonna see there. Can you hear me now? The advantage of being a short person, the thing moves. Okay, so that's not what I want. I can help you. I think I went the wrong way. Hold Here, on, no, no, it. I got it. There we go. <laughs> I learned. So I've been CEO of the Fortune Society for 30 years. Fortune's been around now 50, 30 years. And I love it. It's magic. You get to see people change their lives. We see about 7,000 people come through our doors every year. And people are coming struggling with a lot of things. Some of them are inter internal issues, mental health issues, substance abuse issues, histories of trauma. Some of them are external situations. Um, it's a brutal road home after you've done time with obstacles that make me shocked that the recidivism, ro ro the recidivism rate is as low as it is. We say something like two thirds of people go back within three years, that's the federal statistic, and that includes people who go back because they violated the conditions of parole. When you look at what people are struggling with and the level of obstacles put in front of them, I think it's a tribute to human courage and resilience that the recidivism rate is that low. So what we see is about 7,000 people come through our doors each year. People come because they need a job, they come because they need drug treatment, mental health services, a whole range of services we offer. But housing is the deepest need and the one that's hardest to meet and the one where we turn people away whose lives we could change way too often. So we didn't offer housing when we started. We backed into it and we backed into it because the people we were serving had so few decent options. And most of the decent options out there, and there are not enough of them, for people who are homeless and low income, would exclude the folks we serve. They either wouldn't take people with violent convictions, or if people had a drug history, they wanted a track record of clean time. And you know, for such folks, you're essentially saying, run the gauntlet, and if you survive, we'll house you. So we decided to do housing. We had no clue what we were doing. 
Um, we knew no matter what we did in our learning curve, we couldn't do worse than what was happening. So we scraped the bottom of our fund balance and we bought the shell of a building in Harlem. And that's our building, the castle. Uh, it was a shell. There were crack vials underfoot. There was serious drug dealing going on in the backyard. Uh, our neighbors were more scared of us than they were of the drug dealing in the backyard. And what we ended up doing was pulling together the funding to renovate the building. And our first money in was from OTADA, HHAP, who has been a loyal supporter. They've supported every project we've done and been first money in and been flexible and thoughtful and they gambled on us when we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Uh, we figured it out. And we do some things that are traditional and some things that aren't traditional at all. What we've learned is we define the castle as housing, but we don't. We actually say it's a program that includes housing. And there are wraparound services, very low threshold to get in. We don't care what your conviction is. We don't care what your track record is. We care that you are formally incarcerated, that you're homeless, that you say you want to do something to improve your life and that you're willing to engage in services and do not pose a current risk of violence or threat of violence. That doesn't mean no vi record of violence, right? Most of our folks have pretty serious records of violence. But what we've learned is if you have something beautiful that people really want, they'll figure out new behaviors to be able to stay. And we run one of the safest buildings in New York City with people who have records that are very serious. So we've learned over time, we're 17 years into it. We decided to build in the empty lot that had been the drug dealing place. And that now is housing, permanent supportive housing and affordable housing with 114 apartments mixed between our clients and low income folks from the community. And we see magic happen. We had a deal going with parole. And the deal was this, we won't take your money We'll take your people, but we need a program-oriented parole officer who works with our clients because we don't want technical violations. If there's an issue and it can be worked through, we want to work it through. And our first parole officer retired after many years. He said he had the best success on his caseload of anybody. And we're on our third. The second one retired. The third has just started. But here's what we've learned. If you surround people by supportive services, and if you love them a lot, and if you have high expectations, and if you have an absolute rule of no violence, no threat of violence, and if you offer substance abuse treatment and mental health services, you see people stabilize and turn their lives around and be able to move on to permanent housing. The challenges we face are still enormous, and we are both advocates and service providers. So what we've learned as we started to rent up our own permanent housing and hired a company that did the screening and the lotteries is that they used to routinely discriminate against anybody with records. They would just not accept them, reject them, and then they could appeal. And you know what percentage of people tend to appeal when they're turned down. We succeeded as part of the governor's reentry council in having the governor sign an executive order saying that if you get state dollars for public for affordable housing, you can't do blanket discrimination. You have to look at each person one by one. So what we fell over helped us enact some policy changes. We also learned that you can actually make the funding work, but it's like scotch taping pieces together because our folks get excluded from pretty much everything. So what we have right now in New York City is 1515, which essentially is the promise to make 15,000 permanent supportive apartments available. But it's only the chronically homeless people. People who come out of prison are not chronically homeless. In fact, if you listen to HUD, they're not homeless. They have to sleep under a bridge or go to a shelter first. The chronicity issue not only means nobody coming out of prison is eligible for those apartments, it also means that the people who are the heaviest users, if you will, of shelters and of jails are not eligible either. The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice did a study and they saw that of the people who are most in and out of the shelters and the jails, only 10% were chronically homeless. Why? 
because they're not in shelters long enough because they go to jail. So what we see are a series of barriers that keep people homeless or reincarcerated. And one of the big challenges we're seeing is that we do emergency, we do transitional, and we do permanent, but the money for transitional is vanishing. And what it means in terms of human consequences is that roughly half the people coming out of state prison end up in the shelters. And they don't only end up in the shelters, they end up in the large barracks style shelters that are rife with substance abuse and violence. And I don't know if you could come up with a better setup to try to take somebody who may be struggling with mental illness or substance abuse and have them go under. So we do housing and it's magic and you see people change and you see people flourish. And I have become a housing junkie. I want more housing and we're in the process of looking at several different developments. We've got uh, an arrangement that we just made with Bronx Pro, a for-profit builder with a real social conscience where we're gonna be opening up 57 senior apartments for our folks in the Bronx in two years. And we're developing a piece of land in East Harlem. So we're gonna have more housing, but we're never gonna meet the need. So the hope in speaking here is to fire up other people in doing it. It is magic in terms of people's lives. We were asked by Liz Glazer when she was the Deputy Secretary of Public Safety to replicate our housing model in upstate New York because people coming out of prison had nowhere to go except to the shelters. And we started, I think, in 2013. Mm -hmm. It was uphill all the way. And the building is going to be opening Gee. imminently. So I'm going to pass this on to my friend and colleague, David Condler. But here is a picture. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. First thing I want to do is to publicly do something I don't do enough even privately. And that is to say to this audience that Joanne Page is one of the most extraordinary people I've known in my life. She is generous, she is expert, and she is tireless. The replication I'm about to portray to you would not be possible but for the leadership she provides to an entire team that has supported CCA throughout this process. She even introduced us to the most expert lawyer, Karen Sherman, who's in our audience, <laughs> who, in, who uh, has done a terrific job. But I can't really, frankly, emphasize enough so people here who may not have heard Joanne before recognize what a true pioneer she has been in recognizing this need, in recognizing the obstacles, and literally tirelessly not giving up until we overcome them. So let's give Joanne a rousing round of applause. So both Allison and Joanne have uh, showed what some of the barriers are uh, that lead to uh, people with backgrounds having trouble getting housing, as well as restoring their life. What I'm gonna do is describe the replication process that we went through with Joanne and others' help. I'm gonna to try to show what's similar and what's different. And I'm gonna close by raising a couple of public policy questions. That for me, if anybody in this audience is serious about homelessness, if we're serious, we have to recognize that the reentry population is part of the fuel of that homelessness problem. And there are some serious questions we need to put forward to our state and government and to our city government because there are serious obstacles which are not yet addressed. It's named Freedom Commons in honor of Syracuse's rich history in the anti-slave movement and, and its historic significance in the Underground Railroad. And I would urge people to Google, Google that question about Syracuse's history. It's quite an interesting history as a history buff I'm happy to send you any links. If anybody comes up afterwards, I'll give you a, a, you know, a link or a card and you can get it. It's really interesting. Freedom Commons, like the castle, this is what's similar, has three types of housing. We have the academy. We don't call it a shelter. It's a place where people transform their lives, which provides emergency and transitional housing. But what's different? 
You heard the size of Joanne's academy. Ours is only three rooms with multiple beds in each room for a total of approximately 11 people. Technically, if the, the license permits it, we can go up to the licensed maximum. In theory, depending on whether you look at OTA does square footage or DOC square footage, we could have 25 people. We have 11 apartments in some permanent supportive housing. That is tiny if you think of it compared to the castles. How many? 114. 114. This is small scale. One and two th and three bedrooms, however, because we will have families. And then we have affordable housing, which is sorely needed in Syracuse. We have 43 apartments, one, two, and three bedrooms. But the scale is really dramatically different than New York. But I show this slide to make an important point. There is a single door. There is no poor door. This is going to include townhouses on this side, multi-story, three-story apartments on this side. That's the affordable as well as this. And this side is the, the academy which has mul multiple rooms, which we'll get to in a moment. But the important point is, like Fortune, we have one entry point. The difference with the Fortune project is a really important one I want to sink into a New York City audience. And I should make sure you understand, CCA has offices in Rochester, Syracuse, but also New York City. And I've been somebody who all my life has been frustrated by the cr exclusion of people with criminal records from housing authority projects. Think about it for a moment. Syracuse Housing Authority, not only through CCA's work up there as well as others, for many years has had a different policy than anybody in the country. They do individually assess every single application. They do not have blanket exclusions. But think about this concept that Bill Simmons, were he here, and he's proudly, and we're proud that he's a member of the board of CCA, and Joanne and I are both members of the Governor's Reentry Council, and we're really pleased that the governor, for this reason, has appointed him to the reentry council of the state of New York uh, with Joanne and me. Uh, Bill has a view, he comes from the Bronx, so you know he's all right. <laughs> Bill has a view that people, a son is gonna go visit mom, whether you tell them they shouldn't or not. That's what any of us would do, right? Why in the world would we allow the New York City Public Housing Authority to evict mom? That makes no sense at all. Instead, he says, let's recognize that's what people are going to do. They ought to be coming home, but wouldn't our housing projects be safer if we supported people as they come home? Is that such a hard concept? But Bill is really a pioneer, and he's now the president or the executive, the, I think it's the president of the board of the Association of New York State Housing Executive Directors. So stay tuned. His voice will be heard. And I'm sorry it's not here today due to an emergency. But he is just a terrific voice that I hope many of us will have a chance to hear in the future. They are 50% owners with CCA of this project. They are doing a lot of our property management, the repairs, the leasing, and all of that, while we provide all of the human services and are in every aspect of this together. I put this slide up, Joanne, because it shows that your birth was in 1998. And I want the audience to just think for a moment. That's 20 years ago. It's, Joanne has recognized this need for 20 years, and this is the first replication. I know Joanne wants to woo-hoo how wonderful it is, but I know she'd also be saying, we need a dozen more of these tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. This isn't close to more than a drop in the bucket. And I put this slide up just to illustrate something that I found interesting in looking at an analysis done by the uh, Prison Policy Initiative. If you look at the general public, tw out of 10,000 people, 21 people would be homeless in this country. If you look at people with, with uh, justice involvement, it's 200. That's 10 times out of the general public. If you look at the age differences, there are some interesting things that reveal themselves into, as to what part of those who are having a, a reentry background uh, uh, will most likely be needing service immediately, although absolutely everybody on this chart does. It's interesting to note that 45 and older has the highest rate of, of homelessness. When it goes to prior history, a history of incarceration of more than once is almost double. And then when you look at less than two years, less than two years is dramatically different. 
than people who have been out who have uh, been out for more than four years. So there is a real need for people who are older, for people who have more than one incarceration and who are coming out with less than two years of st stability in the community. What's different about the way this was in, in central New York, just to give you a sense of the attitudes there, in 2014, the, C the CNY Fair Housing Report said, for people looking for housing, having a criminal record is often a non-starter. In 2015, the city of Syracuse said, release from ins the institution is the fifth greatest cause of homelessness surpassing mental health. In the CNY Housing Homeless Coalition in 2018, the first 18 months, found, this is for New York City audience, remarkably small, 529 HUD homeless individuals in the three surrounding counties whose prior living situation was jail, prison, or juvenile detention. But that's 12% of total. But just think about this for a moment. We said that we're gonna have 11 people in our shelter, and we're gonna have uh, maybe, up, or maybe up to 25 in the shelter eventually, and 13 people in our supportive housing. Out of 529 who needed it in the first nine months, are you kidding? That's a joke, this is a drop in the bucket. And we've got to see the demand that exists for housing of this nature. I wanna make sure I do make a proper acknowledgement, not only to the governor's office, but to our local state legislators, because without their support that they have given us financially, we would not have been able to have the technical assistance of the Fortune Society in this project. And it's been really remarkable. Some people might wonder about NIMBY issues. We have worked not only with the community from day one, but with our local elected leaders. So that Pam Hunter, Dave Valesky when he was in the Senate, now Rachel May, are all leaders in supporting the placement of this project. They have helped us link to community partners. We have had dozens, literally dozens and dozens of kitchen table talks with our neighbors. We've discovered a barber who lives nearby who wants to come in and cut hair for free. If you don't get the community roots early, before the construction begins and then when, before it ends, you will have NIMBY. But if you do and you take time to listen to the concerns and you do things that they request, like having literacy programs on the premises, there will be no NIMBY. That's the mistake, candidly, and I'll be very direct about this, and I'm disappointed that when we closed Rikers Island, we didn't do a better job of including the Foxborough president, didn't even have a phone call from City Hall before it was announced where the jail would be. I mean, that is not the way you involve people. In my opinion, I'm sorry to take a political shot, but it's not political, it's really <laughs> just a matter of how you do things with people. Um, there are the financing of this capital portion of this project to construct it. Some people in the room who are developers and so forth won't be surprised by this mix. The first thing we got was our HHAP funding of 2.7. HCR enabled us to get housing trust money of 2.2 and 9.8 million in tax credits, low income time, 9% tax credits, and then there's NYSERDA. These are our, our private sector partners North Star is our co-developer and our construction company. SWBR is our architect, and KeyBank has purchased the tax credits. The funding for rent operations and programs. This to me is something I'm gonna come back to a little bit. Eshai, for those of you who don't know about it, and I will come back to that. Uh, upstairs somebody said, you know, they were talking about Eshai, you know, Sean Fitzgerald and everybody else was talking about Eshai, and somebody said, what's Eshai? We'll come back to that in a minute. Section eight vouchers are supporting rental assistance, and the Onondaga Department of Homeless Services provides us with what they consider to be a shelter allowance to provide support for the academy side. Who's eligible? In the academy side, it's a reentry program with housing, providing emergency and transitional housing for individual adults who are returning for after incarceration and would otherwise be homeless. The permanent supportive apartments is up to 30% AMI, homeless adults and families, history of incarceration and a qualifying disability, and affordable housing is 50% AMI. Applications are chosen by the Syracuse Housing Authority through their lottery system. Joanne said this earlier, and I wanna just pause on this for a minute to make sure you learn what I had to learn that Joanne taught me. She says it's not housing with a program, 
but it's a reentry program that includes housing. The significance of that is really not something that many of us think about necessarily until we get the intelligence of Joanne on this problem. But consider how unstructured a life someone who's homeless leads. Just think about it. They don't know where their meal is going to be each day. They don't know when they're going to wash their clothes properly or how they're going to get the next coat for the winter. Everything is unstructured and unknown and scary as hell. Not that it's not scary in prison. That's what's com in common. But if you're in prison, incarcerated, you are leading the most structured life known to humankind. You are told when you get up, when you go to sleep. You're told what you can eat and when you can eat. You're told which side of the line to walk on and which, whose eyes you can look at directly. There is nothing unstructured about life in prison. The idea that we would think people can just go from a prison cell into an independent living situation is simply ludicrous. It works for some. I'm not saying everybody's the same. They're not. But you have to recognize the difference between the homeless population and people who have justice involvement. They need a different kind of structure, which is why we call this a program with housing, not the other way around. Freedom Commons Academy will include three key things here that people have to buy into. First is a commitment to the program and their own individualized service plan. I'm going to come back to that in a minute so you understand what that means. That there are no acts or threats of violence. As Joanne said, there are many things that people can have coming in. They can be an active drug user. We want to make sure they're willing to engage in a drug program. Uh, but, but we're not going to be saying one relapse and you're out, that kind of thing. We have to engage back into an, a more intensive program or whatever is appropriate. And they have to have comprehensive, we really believe, as does Fortune, in holistic array of services. So to be a little bit more specific, it's a structured environment, a laboratory for new behaviors. This is an important thing that may be counterintuitive to some, but we really believe deeply in their performing community benefit projects. Think about how important it is to someone who's talking to their son after they've come out and they're walking past a park and they say, you know, I repaired those park benches. It's really important for people to feel that they're part of a community and for the community to see the benefit that this group of people is providing to the community. They are members of the community and they are integral to the growth of the community and they're an asset. And that's really important for them to feel and for the community to feel. It's about community building and a time to build a strong transition in order to transition to the next stage of life in the community. I show this slide just to illustrate an important point. We have community rooms and computer libraries. This isn't merely for use by CCA and by those we serve. This is going to also be housing things like literacy for the community or things that community meets at Joanne's Castle. The community board meets there, even though initially the community opposed it. Joanne scares all the kids in the community at Halloween residents at Halloween every year. <laughs> they do all kinds of community benefit projects there as well. 35 hours a week of productive time. That means they have to be willing to be engaged as any of us are in, in work or other things in either a program, education, or job searching. They are not to be out just simply loitering on the street or sleeping in bed. That doesn't work. They have to be committed to transformation. We will have regular drug screening so that we can be clear as to what their current state of use is. It's not a punitive thing. It's more for a matter of planning. There will be a house curfew and AM and PM focus meetings, which are going to be peer-led. This is a slide without a title for an important reason. One of the things that Fortune and we believe is that we should not be structuring programs based on things like criminogenic need or some, some social worker's decision, this is what someone needs. We should be listening to those we serve and asking questions as to what do they see, their strengths, what are their interests, and what do they want? So that we may be providing boxing, not because it leads to a job per se, but something they want to do. We may be having art in the, in the house. We may have writing but not for some kind of inter necessarily uh, motivational interviewing or, or some kind of narrative writing, journaling. This could easily be just because they want to write poetry and want to have somebody from Syracuse University come down and run a class. It can be what they define, music, healthy eating, 
fitness, yoga. We've got to start turning the table and listening to those we serve. Community kitchen, community computer lab, and community room. Joanne uses this phrase, and we will do it too. We're going to have a Thursday night meeting which will include the senior leadership of the of CCA. It's a, a community meeting where the answer is in the room, and that is not the answer from the senior leadership. That's the answer by talking through with your community, as any of us do. If we have a problem with our neighbor, we go to our neighbor and we try to work out the issue. People need those resolution skills, and that's what that meeting is about. Quotes from the castle, Joanne has been incredibly generous with having CCA staff come down every Thursday night just about, it seems, at times, that we come down and sit through their Thursday night meeting. And some of the quotes we've heard that we think are important to share, this is a place where you come to experiment with new behaviors, new way, oops, how did I do that? I don't know what I did there. New ways of be dealing with people. Second one is coming home from prison. A lot of us have preconceptions of what people are about. So it's relaxing to know that people are here to help you. They aren't going, they're not here to get something from you. Switching for a moment now from the academy to the permanent supportive housing. We will be providing a rental subsidy, case management, and support services. The eligibility is that they be homeless, adults and families. We're not unfortunately gonna be able to serve youth in this project. It's something we wanna do in New York City where we do a lot of work with young people at Crossroads and Horizon. Criminal justice history of incarceration, household income 30% AMI, and may have another disability or life challenge like mental health, substance abuse, and a need for supportive services. But important, as you, most of you know, services and supportive housing are voluntary. They're not required like they are in the, in the uh, academy. The type of services offered to both the academy and to supportive ha housing residents will be recovery and treatment and for those of you who may not jump at this, recovery is different from treatment. Some of you may not be aware, we run two recovery centers in Rochester and in Syracuse. These are not for, these are very low threshold, as low threshold as they come. It's not necessarily about abstinence. It is about people doing what the peers want to do. People become members, it's not a drop-in center, so that people will be able to go, not just to drug treatment that's licensed, they'll be able to be members of our recovery community so they can have drug-free weekend barbecues and things like that. Employment and job readiness, literacy, medical exams, conflict resolution, legal services. What that is, just so, if, again, people may not be aware that people with reentry backgrounds often don't even know what's on their rap sheet. And what's on their rap sheet, about th two-thirds of the time, has errors in it. When they go to a job interview, the job, inter the job company may have a, a, ba a, a background check on them, which could be inaccurate. They need to be straightforward and be able to talk about their background and know what it is, and know that there was a, there's something in their rap sheet that was, was, should have been sealed and isn't sealed, things like that, and we get that corrected. Permanent housing, healthy relationships, and more. Important, this slide shows a dozen different ways you can come into both the permanent supportive housing and the academy. We are not simply taking off people only off the coordinated entry list by any means, although we are, for, um, for the, uh, particularly for the permanent supportive housing, but parole and probation, the Onondaga Reentry Task Force, jail and prison discharge planners, law enforcement, signed counsel, human services providers, CCA and SHA staff, county agencies, and so forth. Importantly, both Fortune and we have shared values for over 30 years. That we think it's very important to employ people with lived experience, which might be justice involvement, it also might be a life of homelessness and substance abuse without justice involvement. But we think it's important that they know the community and the people in the community. It's important they be highly skilled interpersonally, experienced with population and systems, and have values that align with our mission, and familiar with local resources and partners. This is where I want to pause on Eshi for a minute. Some of you know this term Eshi and may not have thought for a minute as to what the issue it is, is that we're trying to solve. There's always been a catch-22 for many people building supportive housing. And that catch-22 is that you are trying to convince people to invest in construction and they're naturally saying to you, how are you going to pay for services? For many years, the best people could say was, well, we've got an agency that's been here for 50 years and we've been successful applying to government, so just have faith. This 
solve that problem. Pre uh, any shovel going in the ground, pre getting investment commitments, ESHA enables you to apply for a conditional grant for supportive services. That is transformational. It's also transformational because again, if you think of how small the scale is of Freedom Commons, we don't have the scale necessarily to apply to OASIS separately, to OTADA, to HCR, to 100 different agencies, DOMH. We can't do all of that easily and because we have you know, 11 people. What are you gonna apply for? Two people to be in a, in a mental health program? It doesn't work, but if you draw this money, I hope people just think about how unusual it is for government to be able to get agencies to work together. This is an extraordinary governmental innovation that frankly, I mean, I guess nobody's a junkie like I am of government, but I think Cuomo could have been running on stuff like this. This is a real different thing. Most states don't have something like this. It has eight agencies. It's enabled us to apply for conditional grants. And I'm putting this up because I think this something like this could be the solution for making sure we build more transitional housing. One of the challenges I'm about to outline to the end on the public policy questions is this. We have a wonderful direct commissioner of social services in Syracuse. Her name is Sarah Merrick. She is helping us fund the services on the shelter portion of this, the academy, with her shelter allowance. Her shelter allowance under the state funding stream puts pressure on her for short stays. So it's gonna be 30 or 45 days. Joanne has pointed out to us, most people in the castle are there a year or more. What do you do with that gap? Joanne's brilliant and has lots of fundraising in New York City, but candidly, we don't have the same array of foundations and others to support us in Syracuse. This is a serious gap to building more, re more justice-involved housing. The Joanne pointed out the chronic homelessness is how we rank people on our coordinated entry list. But guess what? If somebody's been in prison, they're not considered homeless. So that's a ridiculous thing that HUD has, has to change. The need for housing for reentry populations, um, I believe it's an unrealistic expectation of a 30 to 45 day turnover. Some of the household composition requirements are sometimes wrong. We believe that people should be able to define their family, sometimes with unrelated people. And the definition of homelessness, Eshi, Eshi is broader than most HUD programs and is able to avoid a requirement that must be in a shelter first to qualify. So we went from a sketch that Joanne showed you and a dream, and now we have reality. It's almost ready to open. It will open this summer. In closing, I want to just make a couple of repetitive points to some degree, but worth repeating in my mind. When we open this summer and start operating, it's going to be a smaller scale than Fortune's had. The bricks and mortar portion I've shown you is frankly the easy part. The hard part is building the culture. If any of you have a chance, I would urge you to visit the castle. What Joanne has created is a place where people, for the sometimes the first time in their life, guess what? Feel safe. They look around and they see a building that is clean. Why? Not because Joanne has a huge janitorial staff, because residents don't want anybody to mess it up, and they clean it up themselves. There is a culture of support and pride and privilege that they feel privileged to live in the castle that is remarkable. The hard part for CCA, frankly, is going to be to replicate the culture of the castle. And we're lucky to have Joanne by our side to continue that. But going forward, in order to assure Freedom Commons financial ability, we're now meeting with the governor's office, trying to see if we can fashion some kind of a pilot to enable us to provide the kind of funding so Sarah Merrick can actually not be messing up her shelter allowance budget and actually develop proper funding for transitional period of time for people leaving. We have to solve this. And we have to solve it, why? Because we can't wait another 20 years to replicate more of this. Thank you very much.
for inspiring us always. Um, I want to leave plenty of time for audience questions, but I'm going to take my moderator prerogative and ask one or two of my own. <clears throat> As David said, unfortunately, Bill Simmons, um, the um, president of the Syracuse Housing Authority, had an emergency and couldn't be here today. But I'm going to ask you guys to channel him in his role a little bit. You talked, David, about how providing housing for people with justice involvement is not the norm for public housing authorities. I know I've been leading a project for years trying mm -hmm. to get our New York City Public Housing Authority to just stop evicting people when they get arrested with, with some success and, and more hopefully to come. But can you talk about what is the, the political backlash or the, the public backlash that that Bill might have had from doing this work and getting involved in this work? Well, first of all, with Syracuse, Bill doesn't get backlash. There's a good reason for that. Bill is, first of all, just an individual who cuts a swath in Syracuse of leadership that's unusual. <coughs> he was a member of the school board. He was a member of the Common Council. He was asked to run for mayor. He decided to work at the Housing Authority because he's deeply committed to its mission and sees its mission more broadly than most housing authorities and said that to the public when they did it. The second reason is, and, and there is risk of political backlash. I mean, I shouldn't say that, that he's not being courageous because he is. Rachel May said to us, please, 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 and we are, please get people from the suburbs to get involved volunteering at Freedom Commons because frankly, we all know what happens. As soon as one horrible incident happens, Suddenly you get Megan's Law or some, na some law named after, any law named after somebody is sometimes, not always, but most times, a terrible law because it's built on bad policy. And frankly, that is the risk. And I will tell you, Syracuse is not like New York City. Unfortunately, if you read the media in Syracuse, you will see it's plastered daily with sensationalizing crime. It's really a disgraceful, I will, I will say it, there, are, there is a racism in Syracuse that is not as apparent in New York City. Not that where there isn't racism everywhere there is. But it's at a level that's really concerning. Right now the biggest fr fight in Syracuse is over whether we tear down a, or not Route 81 which goes through Syracuse. Why? Because the suburbanites don't want to have to walk on the streets of Syracuse. They want to stay elevated over it as they go through. And if they come in, they want to park right next to the place where they're going. There is a different, there is a real sort of southern aspect. Now, I shouldn't say southern because all of the south is progressive now. But there is a, it's not consistent with its history on the Underground Railroad. Yeah. That's the best way to say it. The last thing I just want to say on that last point, and then I will be quiet, is I really do have a dream. And that dream is that we, all this private land that the, I shouldn't say private, vacant land, that the New York City Public Housing Authority has. I live in the Bronx now. And there's a lot of vacant land in between these tall towers. Instead of privatizing it to pay for repairs, I really do have a dream that if we can make Freedom Commons work at a small scale, we could be building small scale reentry housing, not reentry housing, justice involved housing. Joanne's trying to teach me and I'm a slow learn. But, uh, but we, we, need to, we need to create that kind of housing. I would like to see small projects on every housing authority project in some of that vacant land where people are being welcomed home for people in that project. Mm -hmm. Can you just make a distinction there, Joanne? David just caught himself. Tell us what is the difference. Why do you make a distinction between reentry housing and justice-involved housing? And I wonder if you might actually just say a little bit more about the importance of the words we use to describe people who've been in the justice system. Right. I know that's important for you. It's important for the Prisoner Reentry Institute, who's in the process of finding a new name because we find the word prisoner stigmatizing. We don't use it, um, but it's it's in our name, so we're changing our name. So can you talk about that? So let me start with reentry versus justice informed. Um, it is not as though the only time somebody with a criminal justice history who's homeless needs housing is when they're just coming out. Often what people do is come out and struggle and couch surf and struggle and then need much more in the way of support. So we say justice informed because we want to catch people who may have come out a while ago but are crashing into all of the barriers that come with discrimination, mental health issues, substance abuse issues. So 
we know that if people have done time, they have an extra level of trauma, right? And an extra level of stigma that follows them and an extra level of barriers. And so the housing is for people who are struggling with those things to get them into having a good life. Um, the word people matters. I think that what's happening in our field, and Eddie Ellis really was the leader in this, is that there are so many pejoratives and they do damage. You know, the way in which you use words colors how you see things and how you see people. And one of the most vivid ways I saw that was that I was in some meeting with a bunch of criminal justice people and they talked about somebody who made a manipulative gesture. This was somebody incarcerated, a kid with some learning disabilities, and he tried to cut his wrists, but he didn't do it very well. And it got defined as a manipulative gesture. And when you see a kid trying to commit suicide, it's a very different thing than calling it a manipulative gesture. When you call somebody in a pejorative way, you see them in a pejorative way. So we use humanizing language, and we try to kind of pull people up short when they don't. So we talk about people who are incarcerated, people who are struggling with mental illness, as opposed to a label like offender, which we still hear coming from some criminal justice folk. Um, I did some training in a prison in Delaware, and they had the incarcerated men wearing name tags that had a photograph. But the photograph was the photograph of when they were arrested. And one guy who I knew very well by that point always wore it backward, knowing that he faced disciplinary action. And I said, why do you do that, knowing they may put you in solitary as a result? And he said, that is a picture of me in the worst moment of my life. I'm not going to wear it. And we use language that captures people at the worst moment of their lives. So we talk about people. It's that simple. And there's another piece which I think hasn't happened yet in our field. We talk about returning citizens. And I cringe a little on that because I think the ugliest place in an ugly criminal justice system is where the immigration system is layered on top of it. And people who are not citizens, who are coming out of incarceration, are facing even more challenges than people who are not. So I think that be careful on language is really important. Thank you. David, you had a slide that it's, and one of the pictures said, passion led us here, which I think is absolutely true. <laughs> Looking back now for both of you, what are the unexpected challenges that you've come across trying to do these projects? And I'm sure there are probably many, but pick one or two. I'm going to pick one, and it is actually, it still blows my mind. So when we originally created Castle Gardens, we invented a term, right? We called it phased permanent housing. So there's the emergency part of it. And then there's the longer term, which lasts roughly a year for most people. And we did this very deliberately to straddle transitional and permanent, which let us access tax credits and all sorts of good things. But it also let us keep people's homeless status, which was imperative, because otherwise they would not be able to move out. Uh, and we got a HUD application, SHP, Supportive Housing Program, and we checked off the innovative box. And then they got rid of the innovative box. And they said, you are permanent. And we said, hell no, we are not permanent. Because if we become permanent, we'll never have another bid. And they said, you're permanent. And I said, are you saying, this was when we had 59 bids. Now we're up to 81. Are you really saying that we should house 59 people for a long, long time and never have another bid? Or be able to do what we're doing now, which is flip the house and house another 60 homeless people each year? So he said, yeah, house uh, 59, not a problem. I said, it costs more. It pulls fewer people out of homelessness. Do you really want to do that? And the answer was yes. So I went to Washington and asked Sean Donovan to change us to transitional, which means we fight for our funding every year. But we have turnover in the house, which means we can take in new homeless people. That I've normally worked a lot with government folks. And most of the time, if you say, we can do it better and with bigger results if you bend the rules a little bit. Most of the time, our government partners bend the rules. And so hitting a point 
where they wouldn't did blow my mind. Thank you. David? Tell me your question again. Okay, your, your biggest challenge that, you, that was unexpected when you started down this path. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think, I think what I would say is, is actually the biggest challenge is trying to listen more carefully to those we serve. Um, and I don't think I, I, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's really something that every member of our staff has to do like over time. Uh, there are stories that normally don't come out on a quick interview with, and say intake, what people call intake. People need relationships before they're willing to open up and trust, to share really what, what's going on. And that runs so deep. I mean, I, I won't go into the full story, but yesterday was, I met with somebody Joanne knows who was arrested at age 13. He was placed in solitary for 18 years in theory for his safety. He got out at age 42 due to an appeal to the Supreme Court. And as I was meeting with him yesterday, he shared, I've now known him for nine months, I've seen him many times, he shared things with me yesterday he's never shared. And I can't tell you the pain and I feel it fuels the passion you were asking about when I have an experience like that and I know Joanne does daily as well. And you see someone who's literally, think about the pain, all the pain that all of us in this room probably experienced in high school. We all hated high school, right? Because it's where we're learning to socialize. He was in a solitary cell during those years. He never learned socialization skills. He probably is having challenges learning how to empathize with another individual. He's great at talking about his own story. He's great about talking about himself. But learning the harm, frankly, that our prisons to this day do, and the foolishness that we have when we say things, I was at a panel last night at the Bar Association, and, and the Queen's DA person got up and said, you know, we have to make sure victims' voices are heard, as though victims aren't people who are their neighbors, but people who may have done things in the community. They're neighbors, they're part of the same community. There's a we and, there's like a we they thing when people talk that way that's going on that's very disturbing to me. You know, we have to get to a place where when, when people commit a crime, we say, okay, that person's gonna be literally in my hall, in my apartment building, on the apartment across the way, when he comes out, what do we want to happen between now and then? And if you think for a moment in that frame, which is what the Europeans do, the last thing in the world is you would, would be to incarcerate them the way we do now. There are some people who do need, who are maybe not safe to be in the community, but we sure as hell wouldn't traumatize them the way this person I met with yesterday was traumatized. Thank you. Thank you both for really grounding this discussion in the experiences of, of people who have been incarcerated during the criminal justice system. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions. There is a mic right here, and I'm going to ask that people walk to it and use it just so that the entire audience can hear the question. Well, also because it's being recorded, and if anybody listens to this later, we want to make sure your questions are pro and comments are heard on the microphone. It's right back here. Can I ask you? Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, my name is Al Simmons. I'm actually working with the Doe Fund. I remember when the castle first opened and I thought it was the most wonderful thing ever to happen. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wasn't accepted to the program. <laughs> um, there's, there's a few things that went through my mind um, listening to the presentation. First thing is that uh, you weren't talking to me or for me. Um, the other thing is that some of the ways that we identify the problem reinforce some of the stereotypes, the negative stereotypes for people who have been justice involved. Um, and the thing that probably impacted me the most is though it's been said, it, it's not really been brought out in a proper way, and that word is discrimination. 
Um, it's wonderful that we have these projects because if we didn't have these projects, we probably wouldn't have any place to live. But it shouldn't be that way. Um, I've done a lot of work with housing discrimination and unfortunately, justice involvement is not a protected class. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the cases that you know, I tried to litigate as a layman, uh, my litigation was turned from the issue of incarceration or formerly incarcerated to the issue of race. And the answer was, oh, you don't have a discrimination case because we have black people who live in our neighborhood. So um, I don't know what's being done, but I would like to ask what is being done because I don't fit those stereotypes. Unfortunately, well, maybe not unfortunately, but I've been home for five years. Uh, you know, I'm kind of poor. I only make about $50,000 a year, uh, which means that I'm not eligible for any government programs that I could think about. And though, you know, we pointed out that the definition of homelessness needs to be re-evaluated, I would say that I've been homeless for five years, not because I can't afford home, not that I don't want a home, but because every time I put in an application and they do a background check, mm -hmm. it's denied. And the other thing that we didn't talk about, I'm just going to mention this, throw this out there, is the credit check, which I had, I heard nothing about in this presentation. I didn't see any programs that, you know, it's financial literacy because, okay. But that's the other thing that they attach on to it. Oh, no, not because he was incarcerated, but because his credit score is only 550, we're not going to rent to him. So um, what's the plan going forward at, you know, changing some of these policies and, you know, getting people to open up. I mean, the housing stock in New York, we talk about homelessness in New York, but I walk past abandoned buildings and empty apartments every day. Thank you so much, Alfonso, and, and for raising this the policy level. Um, I think Joanne and I can both talk about our our policy projects, which weren't in this presentation, but which go to that direct issue of discrimination, and we're calling it our Fair Chance for Housing campaign. Do you want to talk mm -hmm. about that? Why don't you talk about yeah. Fair Chance, and I'll talk about a lawsuit we're doing. Great, yeah. So um, the Prisoner Reentry Institute is leading, along with the Fortune Society and the Legal Action Center, a Fair Chance for Housing campaign to try and eliminate the use of background checks in housing and housing applications. Um, we've talked to people throughout the country who've done this, and we're particularly um, uh, intrigued and inspired by what's happened in Seattle, where about a year ago they passed a law that prohibited basically all use of background checks um, in housing decisions. Um, and it is a huge, huge problem, and I'm really glad that you've identified that it's not just a problem of the background check. As, as I've talked to people throughout the city about their experiences in trying to find housing, it's multi-layered. It's if you, if you can pass the background check, then there's a credit check. If you can pass the credit check, then maybe your residence history isn't up to snuff. Um, and even on top of that, if you're black, then the landlord just has a moving target about what the requirements are and how big your deposit has to be and how much rent you have to pay up front. And so there's a lot of intersecting forms of discrimination and our campaign has been working really closely with people of lived experience of discrimination in housing to try and figure out if there's ways that we can be creative about not only passing a law that puts criminal records in the human rights law, but makes the human rights law a little more enforceable than it currently is. So a big win was the governor signing an executive order saying you can't do blanket discrimination when you have funding in your building from the state for affordable housing. And HCR is enforcing it which is really great. We have a lawsuit going right now against a major Queens landlord. And what you said about protected classes, being formerly incarcerated is not one. But if you look at our incarceration history, it skews incredibly in terms of uh, over-incarceration of folks who are people of color. So what that means is you can use a disparate impact theory 
that the Supreme Court's affirmed, which is that if you discriminate based on record, you're going to have a disparate impact on people of color, and there's a protection there. So we're suing a major Queens landlord who has a blanket policy that he won't rent to anybody who has a record. And we're in federal court on it, and uh, we're actually going to have a status conference in June. So we're very excited, in August rather, and we're excited about it. But this is about trying to shape policy as well. The other thing we do on an individual level is we work with our clients about building credit history. And it can be like getting a card that's secured so that you begin building a record of payment and so forth, and being really strategic about how you build credit. Because if they don't discriminate against you based on record and you can't come up with the credit, you can be individually assessed and still not get in. So it's about how you negotiate those issues. But you know, you're pointing up the discrimination issue is absolutely real. Well, I would just want to add that I think we should thank you also for emphasizing the importance of finance. Um, people don't talk about things like child support and arrears that get built up. We don't talk enough about fines and fees that get inappropriately assessed. There is currently a bill in the legislature that's not getting nearly enough visibility that may pass this year that the Bar Association tomorrow is about to issue a report on that deals with young people and fines and fees. The idea that we're having to limit it to young people is kind of sad. We should really be just getting rid of a lot of fines and fees, but all of these things build up, and so thank you. I would like to throw in one more thing. Do you know what the public assistance rent allocation is for a single person? $215 in New York City. You couldn't rent a broom closet and stand upright in it for $215. So that is a feeder of homelessness. I'm uh, Josh Goldfein from Legal Aid. Um, the New York City shelter system has been at a record high, uh, but uh, finally uh, most groups, um, most segments of that uh, population are decreasing, the shelter census would be going down, except that one group is, is steadily increasing, and yes. that is single adults being released from state docs custody yeah. without any discharge planning. Um, the state uh, docs has, uh, is relying on the shelter system to be the discharge plan. Um, and so I'm just curious what you think that they should be doing uh, in order to enable people to have a place to go other than the shelter system where because in New York City we have a right to shelter so they can rely on that. Um, but what works in the rest of the state? What should they be doing in New York City? What uh, is the solution to diverting people from shelter? Here's what I don't understand. Why is it that we will send people to one of the shelters that is rife with violence and drugs and costs more than what we do at the castle? I don't understand it. We did something that was mixed in terms of challenge. There were three quarter houses that were basically illegal rooming houses with some real issues about safety that many people felt were better than the shelters. And some of them were engaged in Medicaid fraud, which kind of got in the way of their operating and were prosecuted for it. But I looked at some of those providers because when we have as many people coming to Fortune homeless and we have so few we can house, we were using the better three-quarter houses. And there could have been and could be an investment in the ones that are decently run to make it possible. We don't have anything for single adults who are low income. There's nothing. And we need to develop something. And jail and shelter should not be alternatives. So uh, just a response to uh, the gentleman from Legal Aid. There, Joanne, the way you're responding is about policy and about changing how we fund things. And what I often hear from individuals, because I worked for docs for many years, is that why is the discharge plan such? But we've heard today that there are no alternatives for the majority of the people coming out of prison to New York City and to some extent upstate New York. There is no alternative. So when you say that docs hasn't done a discharge plan, that is the discharge plan because none exist other than that. A lot of these individuals have been away for many, many years. They no longer have family, or their family has moved on to other states, or don't you know they, they or don't want them back. Whatever the reason is, and the parole officer and the institutional uh, side 
worked together from, from, from many months prior to release to try to develop a plan to release an individual to a residence. But these residents are scarce. They don't exist. If it wasn't for the castle and for other programs that are, that are now the wonderful thing that you're doing in Syracuse, we wouldn't have anything. Now, it isn't easier upstate. Uh, a lot of the counties upstate will find any reason to prevent a parolee from coming back to their county. So uh, one of the words that David used earlier, or the phrase, was NIMBY, which is not in my backyard, where in, uh, these counties do not want people coming from their uh, backyard. And what I, when I was working for DOCS, one of the things that we would often hear, especially from New York City HRA, was why can't you do something on your own to, uh, to, for these people? They're your people. And that phrase of your people was always utilized uh, in conversations, meaning uh, they're state incarcerated individuals, they're your responsibility, you find housing for them. You know, why are you just releasing them to us? Well, there are people returning to the communities that they came from. In fact, that's one of our major issues when I was working for DOCS, is that if you try to take a New York City, a person who lived in New York City, and try to, that person is now coming up for release, and I know that the Commons is about to open uh, in a couple of months, and I want to send them there, you might have problems, because what often happens is that Onondaga will say, his history is in New York City. He should be returning to the county of his residence, New York City being five counties, but for this purpose, one, one county. And that happens all the time. Upstate, Onondaga, on Oneida, uh, Steuben, you can name them all, Westchester, they do not take back individuals that are not from their county. They'll try hard not to anyway. They'll try any reason to avoid it. If they find from the uh, previous HRA hist uh, social service history that the, in that the person who's now coming out into community supervision has had an account, you know, an HRA account or a social service account with a different county, they'll say that's the county that person has to go back to. There might not be anything there for that person anymore. They might have a girlfriend who now lives in Sy Syracuse, New York, but can't really have him in the house and he wants to move to start getting acclimated to Syracuse. Uh, the county of, uh, of residence social service department will deny it. So the, all these things are worked on prior to release by the parole officer and the institutional correctional staff. It's just very, very difficult. And it, it's difficult because policies haven't changed. Because there is, because of the fact that we can't call them, uh, you know, we can't find a category for them where they can get funding. And should DOCS fund all this? DOCS has now a $3.1 billion budget right now. The majority is spent on housing these individuals daily within the prison system. I know on the parole side, because that's where I was at, uh, we only had $141 million allocated to parole when, my, uh, when I last left there for supervising individuals in the community. And of course, a lot of that goes towards salaries and you know uh, programs that we might have running in New York State. So, uh, but. When the budget is done every year by the governor's office and by all the state agencies, and DOCS uh, in New York State has one of the biggest budgets of New York State, there is, you know, there is only a certain level we can get to. So uh, DOCS can't ask the governor's office, I want $5 billion this year because I want to have $2 billion for housing because it doesn't exist right now. So I hope I answered some of the question that the gentleman raised. I just want to make one comment on what Steve said. I don't believe DOCS wants to or should be in the housing business. You know, they're not well equipped to know how to do housing. It's really a call to action for people in this room. I mean, if, let's take responsibility ourselves and stop blaming the government. Let's start saying, what are we doing to build housing of this sort? I would ask every developer, every human service provider in this room to go back and think this through. Joanne is eager to help replicate people, so am I help replicate projects like this. We need urgently to solve this problem. And Syracuse, don't be under any illusion, throughout New York State, the problem is universal. People are being released to the rescue mission upstate, and Sarah Merrick, the Commissioner of Social Services, is upset as hell about it. It's a mess. And we haven't talked about what happens with folks convicted of sex offenses. Okay, which is... <laughs> 
If you tried to figure out how to make community less safe, you probably couldn't come up better than what we're doing. You take people you consider high risk and you concentrate them and you keep them homeless and you cut them off at every pass and we treat everybody as though they were the most serious and dangerous and um, so many are not. It's, uh, you know, if we ever did evidence-based work, <laughs> we would never choose to do what we're doing. Some so, of the lowest recidivism is among sex offenders. Guess what? I'm sure most people thought it was the opposite. But also most sex offenders are the friends, the neighbors, the religious leaders, the people you had the reason to trust. And we don't do what it takes to protect people against victimization. We find a couple of people and we beat the hell out of them and feel like we've accomplished something. Um, one comment, just uh, we run um, programs for people with mentally ill. We run forensic ones in New Jersey, and actually we've had less problems with the people coming out. And it, I, I personally found that very surprising as a provider of housing. So, um, so that, I think, speaks to what you're talking about. We haven't had that difficulty. They're serious about you know, getting back involved into the community. Um, my question was, though, just in terms of the, the conscious way you've got the three parts of your housing. Can you kind of go further in terms of what made that thought process? Because I've not seen those three elements in one project before. Yeah, let me talk about the reasoning. The first piece of it, the emergency housing, is that when people come out, they have nothing. Yeah. They often don't have ID. They have no source of income. They often were arrested in summer and get released in the dead of winter in flip-flops. Uh, so the threshold is very low. It's, are you willing to commit, and are you homeless? So we start with people who really need to build from the ground up, stabilize them, get to know them, help them figure out what the next step is. The next step, very often, is to stay longer and to learn the skills that keep people from going back, right? To get the services that help people stabilize themselves, and to get a legitimate income stream that can help them move out, or if they're never going to be able to be fully self-supporting, and we have some people who really need permanent supportive housing, to be able to build enough track record that they don't get discriminated against by the folks who offer that housing. The average length of stay is about a year, and then people are ready to move out, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. We do it very much based on the person, and then the next step is permanent housing. And it could be permanent supportive housing. It could be reunification with family. It could be you got a great job and now you can live on your own. But there's another piece, too. It's not a straight line. In my mind, it's a circle. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we make a lifetime to commitment to people who've come through. Mm -hmm. And we will give them priority for our beds in the castle if they need us again. So we have people who move out and then a relationship breaks up and they relapse and they decompensate. And we don't want them in the streets, and we don't want them in the shelter, and we damn sure don't want them in Rikers. And we let them come home again. And sometimes it's the second or third time around. So if you know something about human change, right, whether it's about how you deal with a drug issue or how you stop smoking or how you lose the five pounds or how you break up the destructive relationships you're in, we don't work in a straight line. Human beings don't. And having the room for that human rhythm that people slip and fall and they need to come up again is really important. So it is a continuum yeah. with room to repeat if you well, need to. And I think that's what I like so much about it because I think so many times we expect them to go from the most structured existence ever to, okay, here's an apartment, here's the keys, have a nice life, show up every once in a while, and it doesn't work that way. So I think that's why I'm so interested in the way you've structured it, and I also really, really like that whole idea, because you're right, you know, it's really somebody believing in you long term, and that ability to go in and out of being successful, because we all do. And the other piece, I think, is there is a religion about housing first, yeah. and one size does not fit all. And people who've been institutionalized for a long belt of time may not do very well if you pop them alone into an apartment. Right, right. And we find that if people live with us for a while, mm -hmm. they build trust, they have a place they can come to when they need support, they figure out which end is up and what they need. Right. And we talk about people, places, and things. They build people. 
who can help them have a good life. We have people who came out of the castle five, six, seven years ago who are living in the community and get together for Thanksgiving. So you build the community as well. Yeah. I just wanted to add one thought on what you just said. <clears throat> I was struck one night when I was at the castle on a Thursday night, and uh, one of the individuals had just left the castle and was living, I think, with his mother, or no, with an apartment. He was talking to his mother on the phone. He started to cry. And when he opened up to the group, he explained, he can't sleep. Why? And this goes to the point I was trying to make earlier. Let's not put the lens of what we think people need, like a clean, quiet, safe apartment, onto the lens of somebody's experience whose experience is so different. He couldn't sleep because it was too quiet. He was used to having noise when he sleeps. He couldn't sleep in an apartment by himself, and it was scary. That's not what we might think, but guess what? Yeah, no, great points. Thank you so much. Other questions? If there are none from the audience, I will ask uh, a few more of my own questions. Are there supportive service needs that are particular to people who've been in the criminal justice system that you know, housing providers providing services for other populations may not have thought about? There's one service we call civic restoration. It is what we think of as th what gets in the way of people getting a job, getting an uh, education, getting housing. And that is going over their criminal background, going over their rap sheet, figuring out if there are li barriers to licenses that, that need to be overcome um, through the work that Joanne and others on the Reentry Council and that we've all been doing. There are some major changes that just got passed that didn't get the publicity of bail reform to make sure that licensing is much easier to do in most categories of New York State. It used to be you couldn't do some of the most basic things that you would think of getting a license for, not just being a barber, but I mean, I'm not even gonna remember them all right now, but it was ridiculous how many licenses were barriered. And it occurred to me to add, you asked earlier about why it is that people wouldn't want housing like this politically and the political backlash. We haven't really pointed out the backlash Governor Cuomo got when he tried to restore higher education to people with people who were in prison by restoring certain grants that could enable people to have education in prison. How dumb is this that we don't want people in prison to get the very best education? Think about it. If you're going to, you want them, think about it in that lens that they're going to be your neighbor, and then ask what you want them to be, what you want them to have. I understand the issue. Many of us have, I have three kids who have huge student loans, and why would somebody who's committed a crime get a better deal? That's a realistic political fight. But let's be real about what, what, we, what we're trying to achieve as a community and as a family. And one more question for you guys, going on this political backlash. I think a lot of the political backlash does come in the form of, in the form of NIMBYism. Um, and you touched on this a little bit more, David, but I also know Fortune Society did a lot of work around overcoming NIMBYism mm -hmm. um, with, with the castle. And, and could you speak a little bit more about that, Joanne? We hit it in a big way. In fact, I think our ignorance saved us because our building is at 140th Street and Riverside. And the building right across from it is a Michelama that turns out 500 votes in a low vote district. And I think people who knew much more about the political dynamics did not buy the property for that reason. So we moved in. We actually didn't move in. What we ended up doing, it took us a couple of years to raise the money that it took to build the building. And what we did was we met with everybody. Uh, we put enormous energy into this. But the opposition against us was tremendous. I remember being in that building for a meeting with the tenants and I remember a woman screaming in the back, you're bringing them in to rape our daughters. And I remember one person saying something positive, and they jerked out the microphone cord so that she couldn't be heard. And the building, Department of Buildings, somehow the plans got stolen. And they tried to take our building by eminent domain. And so there were like things coming at us out of the shadows. But what we did was something very, very simple. We put huge energy into being good neighbors. We started going to six meetings in the community every month. We had a team that went to the police precinct council 
and it was somebody who was one of our senior job developers who'd been a major drug dealer in the neighborhood and a real pillar of the community. And they went together to the police station. And that was the first time he'd ever been in the police station when he wasn't in cuffs, but it was a statement of who we were. And we just stayed so that if people had an issue, they would turn to one of our people in the community board meeting and say, I've got a problem. And we would straighten it out. So by the time we were ready to open the building, we'd built a lot of trust. And then, and we've advised this for Freedom Commons, we built a community advisory board that was mostly people who didn't want us there. And we built trust. And we did it the way you treat people and be a good neighbor. And by the time we were ready to build in our empty lot, our neighbors said, we need housing too. And we had been planning on building housing just for our folks. And we ended up doing mixed housing, partly affordable, partly supportive. And we ended up with everybody who fought us fighting to get us funding. And then we ended up with political problems because people were lying about their income to try to get into the building. <laughs> and now it's beautiful. We terrify the neighborhood children on Halloween. We're a polling place. Um, we're a place where the tenants associations meet. We actually have had to have police protection when Columbia was going to the community board and eating up the affordable housing in the neighborhood because our facility was at risk because we were hosting the community board meeting. So it's flipped, it's flipped completely. And the Furman Center has done assessments of what happens when you build supportive housing in a community. Property values go up. We made our neighborhood safer. And when people realized that, the people who opposed us most were the long-term community members who really cared about the neighborhood. And when they realized we were gonna make the neighborhood safer, well, it flipped. We now do a produce giveaway on Wednesdays and all the neighborhood moms are there. And building something for the community in terms of what the community wants and building trust is really what, what did NIMBY in for us. Thank you so much. Uh, if there are no last questions, I think we should give a round of our applause. <laughs> We welcome you to come visit. You can come to us in Harlem, or you can go to Syracuse and see. Or us in Brooklyn. Marvelous, right? <laughs> or us in Brooklyn. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you.